Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Monday and to our class. Uh, we are going to be looking at the last chapter today and probably will be the uh, last class because we've uh, completed all our lessons. Um, so before we begin, can I ask uh, uh, Anita, can you please lead us in prayer? Uh, yeah, ma'am. <clears throat> thank you. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us, all of us here. Thank you for each one of us, Lord. And I ask you to bless each one of us. As we are learning from your word, Lord, help us to understand from your word, Lord. Thank you for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, the lesson, uh, Son of God. And this is one of the titles of... Uh, uh, that's been uh, given to Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man. Uh, so we look at this, and uh, if you look at your notes, uh, you know, there's just a couple of uh, lines there, uh, just basically, uh, you know, uh, scripture references from Matthew 16, then uh, how to live by faith from Galatians 2.20, uh, and then a couple of uh, other references about uh, the Son of God as the prototype for the sons and daughters of uh, God. So before we look at those, we'll just uh, kind of, um, you know, look at a few scripture references um, uh, to see who really is the Son of God um, and who is God himself. This is something that we've already uh, studied uh, in the previous chapters. Um, and it's also something that we uh, looked at or studied in um, uh, in doctrinal foundations, uh, systematic theology. And um, we have already looked at most of these scripture references also in lessons 1 to 12. So we just uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, um, look at who is God himself. And then we look at the Son of God, his role, and what is our response. Okay. So... Before we begin, we'll just uh, look at uh, three scripture passages. One is in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 1, <clears throat> which you've already uh, seen and read uh, before in our classes. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 4, we've already looked at it and read and studied that in detail um, in Christology and doctrinal foundations as well. And then we look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verses uh, 34 and 35. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we read that in the beginning, God uh, created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, um, you know, because we've already read this a couple of times, I'm just kind of um, uh, reviewing it. So, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made and was for in him was life and the life was the light of men. Then we look at uh, Luke chapter 1 verses 34 and 35. So can I ask one of you to please read Luke chapter 1 verses 34 and 35, please? Luke chapter 1, 34 and 35. Uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 34 and 35. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, the Mary is being told by the angel that uh, she's going to conceive about the power of the Holy Spirit and the one that is to be born uh, will be called the Son of God. So we see that scripture states to us in these three uh, scripture passages that in the beginning, uh, 
you know, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the realms, uh, heaven and earth. Uh, but before the beginning, you know, um, uh, there was God. Okay, God existed even before the beginning. God was there before the beginning. And God was the cause uh, of the beginning. We've already studied this. Um, so what do the scriptures reveal about this God who was there before the beginning? Uh, we'll consider a, a few things. All of these we've already looked at and studied. Uh, we know that this God who was there even before the beginning uh, is eternal. He was, he is, he will always be. Uh, we read this in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27, where it mentions that he is the eternal God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, which says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible uh, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So this verse in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, talks about uh, this king who is God, who is eternal, immortal, and um, invisible. And we've already read uh, Psalm 90, verse 2, in the chapters that we've already studied previously. Uh, it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or even uh, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are um, God. And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, reads this way. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. So if you look at all of these references, which I've just mentioned in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, Psalm 90, verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, and Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27, it talks about uh, God who is eternal, who is immortal, invisible, uh, who is from everlasting to everlasting. And he is the everlasting God whose understanding is unsearchable. Now, all of these points that I'm being, uh, uh, you know, mentioning here is not in your notes. Uh, sorry. In your notes, you have just... Uh, a few scripture passages that, that have been uh, mentioned of, for this lesson, the Son of God, uh, which is our last chapter. Um, so, you know, I'm just giving you a little more uh, extra things. And this is all from, uh, you know, the sermon that I've taken from Pastor's sermon on titled the Son of God. Okay, so before we look at the few uh, scripture passages that are there uh, uh, in your notes, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to give you a brief about um, the Son of God, the title Son of God. And, uh, you know, we'll just talk about who God is before we look at the, uh, the role of the Son of God, what he accomplished and what is our response. Yes. Abu Bakr, I thought you had your hand up. Do you have a question? No, my it was a mistake. Okay, no worries. So, uh, if you like to take down notes, you're welcome to do so because all of these things that I'm mentioning are not there, but I could share the PDF copy of the sermon notes, uh, which I'm sharing now with you, uh, which is uh, the sermon titled Son of God, which was preached by Pastor Ashish. So, I'm just taking uh, the notes from there. Okay. So, we see that God is eternal. Uh, we also see that he is self-existent. He's a God who's self-existent. And all of these points, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we've already looked at. Uh, he's self-existent. He has life in himself. And uh, John chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as a father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. Uh, and so we know that and we studied already that, uh, you know, God is, uh, does not depend on any, anything for his self-sustenance. Uh, uh, he's self-sufficient, uh, he's self-sustained, self-existent, uh, and uh, he has life in himself. He does not depend on anything uh, for his sustenance and for his life. So he's self-existent. We also studied and learned that he is infinite. Uh, there is no measure to his attributes. 
Uh, there is no measure to his greatness, to his power, uh, to his wisdom and his um, understanding. A few scripture verses that talk about this is in Psalm 100, 104 verse 1, which says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. Okay, so it talks about the greatness of God. You are clothed with honor and majesty. That is Psalm 104 verse 1. Psalm 147 verse 5 talks about this God who is great, who is mighty in power, and whose understanding is infinite. So God in his uh, attributes, uh, you know, is great, uh, uh, has no limit in his understanding. He is uh, limitless. Uh, his understanding is infinite. Um, the prophet Isaiah says uh, um, that to whom then will you liken God or or what likeness will you compare him to? So no one can compare God to anything or anyone because there is none like him. There is no measure of his greatness. There's no measure of his power. And there's no measure of his wisdom and understanding. Now this um, uh, this thing that I quoted from of Prophet Isaiah is in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 18. So this God who existed even before the realms of the world and heavens were created um, is a God who is infinite, is a God who is uh, eternal and uh, a God who is self-existent. He is also a God of wisdom. He has all wisdom, uh, understanding and um, knowledge and we can see it from uh, the way he has created the world in such uniqueness, perfectness, um, in such uh, creativity and um, a wisdom that it is created. Everything that he does, he does in his wisdom. Uh, we also studied that, uh, you know, uh, God is one in three persons. He's a triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, if you read this uh, in the NKJV version, it says, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So if you want to prove uh, uh, to anyone that, uh, you know, there is one God who exists in three persons, uh, another scripture reference uh, is uh, 1 John chapter 5, um, verse 7. And this is, I think, only in the NKJV version that it says, you know, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Word that's talking about Jesus Christ. And uh, we can, you know, how do we know that the Word is Jesus Christ? You go back to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Okay. Um, so that's talking about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And it says, and these three are one. Okay, uh, so we know that the triune God, they are co-equal. Uh, each one of them are equal. Each one of them have the same substance, the essence, the nature that makes them uh, God. And each one fully represents the uh, Godhead. The Bible also reveals to us that this God is the God of glory. Um, uh, his glory is seen in his very nature and who he is in his essence, in his expression of who he is and what he does. Uh, the glory of God is also the expression of all of his attributes, uh, which is his goodness, his mercy, his truth, um, which we see uh, his glory being manifested in a very powerful way. Um, we also know that God's glory is so precious that he will not share it with anyone else. Uh, can one of you please read Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, please? Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. Can one of you please read that? Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Thank you. 
uh, Rosalind. So here we see that, uh, you know, God's glory is so precious that he will not share it with anyone else. We also know that each person of the Godhead, that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each one of them have the glory that uh, uh, glory that uh, that is of God. Uh, so each one of them held the glory of the Godhead. Um, we read this in uh, the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus in John chapter seventeen. So can one of you please read uh, John chapter seventeen? We've already looked at these scripture passages, but good to read them again. Uh, John chapter 17, verses 5 and verse 24. So can one of you please read uh, John chapter 17, verse 5, and someone else can read verse 24. John chapter 17, verses, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. Thank you. Verse 24 again, please. <laughs> Father, I will I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou loved me before the foundation of the world. Thank you. So here we see that, um, you know, in verse uh, 5, uh, Jesus is saying, um, you know, when he lived on the earth, he, he had the sonship glory. Uh, he refrained from using the, uh, the glory that was of God. Okay. And if he had the glory of God, none of us could see him or even, uh, you know, know him or uh, relate with him in a personal way. So we see that, um, you know, he tells the father, uh, father, now glorify me with the glory I had even before the world was very important to note this okay so how do we know that jesus was even was there even before the creation of the world uh, even before the foundations of the world was laid uh, this verse clearly says that you know um, it was 5 of uh, john chapter 17 father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had with you before the world was so this is one of the verses that talks about jesus being uh, self-existent and be hence being god that he was there even before the foundations of the world and uh, you know he is god himself and verse 24 uh, you know it says that um, uh, that he desires that we may have the sonship glory those who believe in him that have this have uh, the sonship glory um you know you and then he says that um father i desire that they also whom you have you have given me may be with me where i am that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundations of the world so if you notice here again uh, the phrase the, before the foundations of the world, which is very, very important for us to note because we know that uh, Jesus uh, was not just uh, born in a certain uh, time. Uh, of course, he was born in a certain time in history, but uh, his existence is uh, uh, even before uh, the world was created, even before the foundations of the world. Uh, he was uh, God. He is God. He will ever be uh, God. And so this is another verse that uh, shows us that, you know, he is God and he had the glory. Uh, of God himself and hence he is God and he had it even before the foundations of the world okay uh, and hence we see that uh, each uh, a person in the trinity is uh, fully God they fully represent the Godhead okay we also know that uh, and scripture reveals to us that this God is a God of uh, love okay uh, we also know that there was uh, love that was shared among the Godhead, among, uh, between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, love defined the relationship that is in the Godhead because we read in uh, John chapter 4, verse 8. This is something that we've already looked at, these reference uh, references, so I'm just uh, stating them. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, which talks that God is love. 
Okay, that is who he basically is. That's the very core of his uh, his nature, his substance, his uh, of who he is. So, one John chapter four verse eight says, "God is love." John chapter seventeen uh, verse twenty four that we we basically read, you know, uh, again says that uh, you know. Uh, you know, Father, let them uh, be where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me, uh, and that you loved me even before the foundation of the world. So we see that there was, uh, there is love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? This verse in John chapter 17, verse 24, which we just read now, uh, shows us that there is, there was love, there is love between uh, the Godhead, between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because Jesus said, you love me, let them, uh, let all of us uh, who, all of them who believe in me, be where uh, I am, that was Jesus' prayer to his Father, and uh, so that they can see his glory, and they would know that, uh, you know, that the Father has, uh, has loved the Son even before the foundation of the world. Now, this God who created uh, the universe, who is self-existent, who existed even before the foundations of the world, has life in himself. And that is what scripture reveals to us, that uh, John chapter 1, verse 4, we read this uh, verse in the beginning of this um, class. We also have seen this in detail and studied this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we, uh, what is this life here? What is the Greek word for this life here? We studied this. What is the Greek word? Anyone remembers? Zoe. Thank you. Um, it is Zoe. And what does Zoe mean? God kind of life. Yes, it's the God kind of life. It's the life that God has in himself. Uh, uh, the self-existent, uh, uh, the immortal, uh, the, the self-sufficient, uh, the fullness of life that God has in himself uh, is the life that he gives to all of us who believe in him. So we know that uh, God, God is life. He is life. He is a source of eternal life, the source of immortal life. And, um, and the Zoe is the God kind of uh, life. Uh, he's also... This God whom, uh, who created the heavens and earth, who is, uh, was there even before the foundations of the earth, um, uh, is light. Uh, he's a God of light. This God is light himself. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Uh, we looked at this uh, reference also. Uh, he's someone who dwells in unapproachable light. It says, who alone has immortality, uh, dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to him be honor and everlasting power. So uh, his uh, light, he lives in unapproachable uh, light. Okay. And we also learned that this God is the great I am. Uh, he, he is somebody who dwells in the eternal uh, now, and he also lives outside of time. He also lives outside of time and space. We are limited to time and space, but he lives right now in the present, but he's also uh, somebody who lives outside of time and space. Space and time cannot uh, contain him. Um, time is irrelevant to him. Uh, he lives outside the realm of time and space. Uh, so for him, uh, you know, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day uh, uh, which is uh, given to us in scripture, which just, uh, you know, uh, goes to say or just is an attempt to convey to us uh, that for God, um, you know, as uh, time as we know it does not matter to him because he lives outside uh, time and uh, a space okay for us time and space matters but for him it does not matter he lives outside time and space he's the alpha and the omega the beginning and uh, the end everything begins with him everything uh, will end with him um, and he is the one who ordains things that are happening in time and in um, history okay um, and we know before the beginning, uh, the uh, I am uh, 
was present. He stood at the beginning, uh, and he is also at the end of time as we uh, know it or we understand it, because we know that you know things will come to an end. Uh, but he is the I am who stands at the very beginning, uh, but also stands at the end of um, uh, time. Okay. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 46 was then that he declares the end from the beginning. Uh, so he stood at the beginning and at the end and he declares everything that has happened from the very beginning uh, to that which will happen uh, uh, till the very end. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 15 verse 18 says known to God from eternity are all of his um works so we see that he is the great i am uh, who dwells uh, or lives outside time and space but also dwells in the eternal uh, now everything begins with him everything ends with him uh, and he has declared everything that has happened from the beginning of time uh, that is happening now and that will happen at the end of uh, time okay um so we see uh, all of these characteristics of God who is um, who was there uh, even before uh, the very beginning of time, of space, of uh, the world being um, created. And we all scripture also tells us that all of the things that, uh, you know, that we see in, in history uh, that has happened, that is happening now, that will happen in the future was something that was already completed completed uh, in uh, the mind of God even before it began, even before it started. So God completed all of his works even before he started or even before it uh, started in time and he finished uh, everything before it even began. So, you know, that is what uh, we read in scripture. So God completed all of his works before he started it and he finished everything before he even uh, began. Uh, if one of you can please read Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3, please. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. Hebrews 4, 3. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declare on oath, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. Amen. So here, uh, thank you, Subhashit. So here we see in this, um, in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 3, that all of his works, even before they began in time, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, before it even started, all of his works were finished from the foundations of the, uh, even before the foundation of, this, uh, of the world, everything that God had planned uh, was already completed even before he, he had um, started. So what did this great I am complete even before it began uh, to unfold in history? Okay. Uh, any answers on that? I'll repeat the question. So what did this great I am the God who is eternal, uh, full of wisdom, infinite, uh, who lives in unapproachable light, light the triune God, uh, whose wisdom is unsearchable, uh, who has life in himself, uh, who is the great I am. What did he complete even before it unfolded in history? Any thoughts, any ideas? I think because God is eternal and is uh, out of our time and space, uh, He has finished all the works before the foundation of the world means in His mind, the mind of Christ is completed. And it is the uh, brighter and the temptation occurring in the world. Uh, thank you, John, but uh, it was not too clear. Uh... 
your uh, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Uh, you said it uh, all that he uh, wanted to do. He ah now it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Ah uh, yeah. So I was saying in the mind of Christ, it uh, everything which ha which uh, has to happen is already completed, and the dispensation occurs in the world step by step. Um, so in the mind of Christ, the, our redemption, our salvation, even our life in eternity is already completed in the mind of Christ. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, thank you. That was clear. So, uh, yeah, redemption, salvation, uh, which happened at a point in time in history, was already completed in the mind of God. Uh, yes, even for the foundation of the world. Thank you. What else? What else other than uh, redemption, salvation? What else was uh, completed in the mind of God? Okay, let's look at uh, a few uh, points. Um, you know, God decided to have a family of sons and daughters, uh, people uh, who he could love and be loved by him. Uh, so it is uh, basically he decided to have a family uh, of people who would be called the sons and daughters who he would love uh, and be loved by him. Uh, we read this in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Okay, so he decided to have uh, or uh, decided and also was a completed done thing in the mind of God, even before the foundation of the world, to have a family of people. He also decided that uh, he will be our um, father. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, can one of you please read that? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 5. He to be holy and he predestined us to be adopted as his son through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pressure and will. Thank you. So he is uh, the father predestined us to be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his uh, wills. Uh, so here we he we see that God already decided that He will be our Father. Uh, he decided that He would create uh, people uh, in His own image, in His own likeness, uh, people who would be uh, free mortal uh, moral beings. Sorry, free moral beings who have the free will to choose. Uh, 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 and he, we also see that He created us in His own image and uh, likeness. Um, uh, however, he knew that when he is giving us the free moral uh, will to choose or he's creating us as free moral beings, he knew it there would be a problem. Uh, he knew that uh, we would rebel and that we would sin against him, uh, that we would uh, give away what he has entrusted uh, to us. Uh, he entrust, what, did he, what did he entrust to us uh, in, uh, when he created Adam and Eve? What did he entrust to them? The Garden of Eden to to take care of it and to uh, to work on that. Thank you. Yes, he uh, gave them uh, to tend the garden and to subdue it. Okay, uh, to subdue it. Now, when you uh, when you look at this word subdue, what comes to your understanding? Why did God use this word subdue here? Well, this is just out of the context, I mean, uh, not part of the lesson, but it's good to just get a knowledge of it. What's the meaning of subdue? Uh, it means to rule and also to take care. Okay, it means to rule, but to rule with what it's like a military term like subdue means uh, take under control uh, 
of somebody who's going to rise up uh, and, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, be uh, like an enemy or try to overtake you. Uh, so subdue means keep under, yeah, conquer, keep under, uh, you know, uh, under your power, under your authority. Uh, so it's like a military term. But why does God use this military term subdue? Who does he want to subdue? There was only Adam and Eve. There were uh, the animals and uh, there was God. But the animals were no way. Everything was perfect. Um, uh, you know, uh, Adam and Eve could uh, even uh, sit uh, beside a hungry lion or a tiger uh, or, uh, you know, and they would not eat him up because everything was perfect. There was no murder. There was no killing. So why does God use this word subdue? Yes, thank you, Paul. The word is dominate. Good. Why does God say uh, subdue? When everything was perfect, why do you have to keep dominate? Why do you have to keep under control? Because everything was created so perfect, there was nothing you need to control over. Basically, God knew that, you know, uh, Satan and his demons, his forces were there on the earth and they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, come and tempt and try to overpower Adam and Eve. And hence he says, you know, you have to subdue, you have to take control. God had given them uh, the, uh, sorry, the authority to take control, to dominate. And hence there were, uh, you know, uh, God was telling them, you know, uh, be aware, take control, take authority of your uh, possession of what I have uh, uh, given to you because he knew that there was the enemy who would come and steal it away from uh, them. Okay, now this is just a side thought uh, because we were just looking at this reference. Coming back to what we were talking about, uh, so God knew that, uh, you know, if he created us uh, as free moral beings, there would be a problem. He knew that we would rebel against him, we would sin against him. He knew this even before the foundations of the world. Um, and he knew that, uh, you know, we would give away what was entrusted uh, to us. Uh, he would. He knew that Adam and Eve would give it away to the enemy. They will give their authority, their power. They will be subdued by the enemy. They will become his uh, slaves. And he saw that sin would finally taint the world, would make everything that he created perfect, would become imperfect, uh, and that he would have to recover them back and that would require the work of redemption. So um, the question often people ask is when God uh, knew that Adam and Eve, uh, you know, would sin, uh, or, you know, would, uh, uh, and sin would destroy the world, and why did he even create that uh, tree? Or why did he even uh, want it to be there? So, you know, we see that, you know, God knew everything that is going to happen. He saw everything even before it uh, came into existence, uh, even if even before they were formed and even before uh, sin came into the world, God already had the plan of uh, redemption. OK, uh, in his mind, and it was a completed done, completed thing that he even saw Jesus come, the son of God come. Uh, become the perfect Lamb of God, take the sins of the world and uh, redeem mankind back to himself. Redeem uh, the family that he created uh, to be his sons and daughters, to redeem them back to uh, God um, and also to redeem this family who God said he will be their father, he will love them and, they will, and we will be loved by um, him. So, you know, uh, uh, when God foresaw all of these things, there would have been a discussion uh, in the Godhead. Well, this is not given in the Bible. This is just something that uh, we try to understand. There would have been a discussion in the Godhead. Um, and the second person of the Godhead, uh, who is the eternal word, uh, you know, would have said that I will become the lamb to bear the sins, uh, to take away the sins of the entire world and bring back mankind to ourselves, to bring them back to 
uh, us to where they belong. So we see that uh, the eternal word became the Lamb of God even before uh, the foundations of the world, even before uh, the beginning. Now we can see this, uh, you know, this is there in scripture uh, about the discussion that happened between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit between the Trinity is not there. It's just something that we are assuming, that we are thinking. But Jesus uh, being the eternal Lamb of God, even before the beginning of the world is given to us in scripture. Uh, so can one of you please read First uh, Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 20, we already read this, but good to read it again. And Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. So one of you, can you please read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, and uh, someone else can please read uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Thank you. So here we see that, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, Jesus Christ was foreordained before the creation of the world, but he has manifested himself in these last times, in this time in history, this point in history. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb. Uh, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Thank you. So please underline that in your Bible, the lamb that was slain even before the foundations of the world. So Jesus Christ, uh, or in the mind of God, uh, or in the mind of the Trinity, uh, this was a completed, done uh, uh, act that the lamb was slain even before the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain for the redemption of the sins of mankind and purchased and redeemed mankind back to God even before uh, sin even began on the earth or sin entered the world. Okay, And so because of the Lamb of God, uh, we all have redemption through his blood uh, freely, which we receive freely by his grace. Um, and our sins are forgiven uh, and we are accepted back into his family as sons and daughters. And we are loved by um, God. And this is uh, mentioned to us in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 7. We read this when we were studying about redemption uh, uh, in um, doctrinal foundations. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of his grace. Okay. But all of this was already conceived, completed, done thing even before the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain even before the foundation of the world. Okay. So um, we are looking at basically, um, you know, what are, um, what did this great I am complete even before uh, it began to unfold in history. We saw that uh, he decided to have a family uh, who, would, uh, who he would love and uh, we would be loved by him. He decided that he will be our father. Uh, he also decided that we will be adopted as his uh, sons and daughters. And it was already decided that uh, Jesus would become that Lamb of God uh, and the Lamb of God was slain even before the foundations of the world. Okay. The other thing is that, uh, you know, uh, which was already uh, a completed thing or uh, in the mind of God, um, something that the great, great I am completed even before it began to be unfolded in time in history uh, was that we would be adopted as sons and uh, daughters. So the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit saw through time and they saw that, uh, you know, some will accept this Lamb of God who is the Word, the eternal Word that is Jesus Christ. And some will reject uh, the Lamb of God who is Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, and uh, the Godhead already foreknew or they already saw uh, beforehand uh, the choices each one of us will make, the choices each person will make. And they decided that those who make a choice uh, uh, of believing in the Lamb of God, who is the eternal word, who is Jesus Christ, that, uh, you know, they would be made back as sons and daughters. 
and not just be made as sons and daughters and be back in the family of God and be loved by him, but they would be transformed into the very image of the son of God. So each one of us uh, who made the choice, it's not something that... Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 something that uh, God foresaw, the Godhead already foresaw and foreknew that we would be making that choice that each one of us will choose the Lamb of God. And they already knew beforehand, uh, you know, who will make the choices and they already knew who will be their sons and daughters and who will be transformed into the very image of the, uh, of the Son of God who is um, Jesus Christ. So God decided uh, beforehand, before the foundation of the world, that those who choose him, choose his son, choose the Lamb of God, the eternal word, will be conformed to the image of his son. And this is something that he already predestined. Okay, uh, we read this in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30. Uh, can one of you read that again, but please? Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called, whom he called, this he also justified, and whom he justified, this he also glorified. Thank you. So here we see that... Uh... You know, he predestined, that means even before the foundation of the world, God predestined those who would be conformed to the image of his son, that is those who accept the Lamb of God, who believe in him, those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, will be conformed to the image of his son. There will be his uh, sons and daughters. Now, this whole topic of predestination, which is a big theological uh, debate, a controversy, a study uh, about predestination, Predestination, uh, you know, is something that, uh, uh, you know, many theologians argue, many uh, say that, uh, you know, God is partial. He predestined some for heaven, some for hell, some to be his sons and daughters, some to be, uh, you know, a bit, uh, be thrown into hell. So uh, what do you understand by this word predestined? He pre predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. If somebody comes and argues with you and says, you know, it says here in scripture, he predestined come some to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestined those he has also called, those he's called, he's justified, those he's justified, he's glorified. So what do you understand about uh, predestination? Has God chosen some for eternity, uh, some for hell? We discussed about this, we spoke about it. Any thoughts? I think it means the future which is already decided. Okay, thank you, Paul. What do you understand by predestination? Did God conform some to be his children and some to, you know, be his enemies, to be against him? So whenever we uh, try to understand God and uh, understand his ways, we always need to go back to his, uh, what are the two things that we need to look at to understand God and his ways? His word, his nature. His word and his nature. Thank you. His word and his nature. So we go back to his nature. So it's, uh, uh, the God who we serve or the God who created us, the God of the universe, is he a partial God? Is he a partial God? No. You know, if you look at uh, scripture verses, uh, it, it says that uh, I think in uh, one is in Romans chapter 5, uh, I think Romans chapter 5, verse 11, I think. 
not sure, but uh, you know, it says that you know the God is our God is not a partial uh, God. Okay, I'll just give you the reference. It uh, okay, it's time up. Uh, okay, we'll take a break and uh, we'll come back because it's nine fifty, and then we'll discuss about predestination, about God's uh, nature, about Him being whether He's partial or not. He's not partial, but we look at it in uh, Scripture. Okay, okay, we'll take a break and come back. Thank you. <laughs> 